be happy to note that unless we work with communities and ensure it's a win-win for both, we don't actually do that. Um, and hopefully at the end of all of this, we'll have a secure natural heritage of India. Uh, not very long ago, we met in a spare bedroom in my house. And you can see what's happened in 17 years, how old I've become. But anyway, we formed the Wildlife Trust of India, uh, trying to do a, a few things a little differently. And as um, one of them mentioned, uh, this has really grown over the years. And we do work across quite a few regions of India, not all of India, but, but in certain areas like the Northeast, like the Himalayas, parts of the West, Himalayas, Western Himalayas, the, the Gangetic Plains, uh, some parts of Central India and the Southern Ghats, the Eastern and Western Ghats, we do a lot of work, as we do in Marine. Uh, I did say in my opening uh, lecture, I think, that we believe in, 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 a, in a cyclical uh, world and the fact that to make difference to animals or the natural ecosystem, you need to work perhaps on many things. Just by working on one aspect, you don't really get the whole. Yeah? Somebody gave a presentation on an elephant and, and the various ways of looking at it, vis-a-vis -vis the blind man feeling the elephant. Like that, animal rights people, animal welfare people, wildlife conservation people, all feel different parts of the animal and come to a different conclusion. But we rarely try to use a variety of ways uh, to tackle a problem. First ideas, uh, I'm sorry, we've got about seven ideas which we call big ideas in our organization. And one of them was to secure land. Many of you are from India, I don't need to tell you that. I can see many of you are not from India. And uh, the, 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 the crushing reality of 1.2 billion people is something that makes me lose sleep. If I leave something for my next generation, it will be land, or a house, a roof, for my sons or daughters if I have. For animals, if they are indeed creatures who you wish to list something for, it will be land. They won't be land very much longer. Mark Twain, I believe, said in America that when you see land, buy it or grab it. I forget. In America, you grab things, right? So when you see land, you grab it. They ain't making it no more. Right? So if you want to give something to animals, you need to give them land first. So we, were, we did want to give land 1% outside the critical protected area systems of India. 1% in India is a hell of a lot of land, so that's a great vision to have uh, through your lifetime to achieve that. Then individual animal uh, rescue. Uh, nowhere in, in, in human conservation or uh, you know, in, in human welfare do we feel that if the population of the human species is fine or the population of India is fine, you can lose your grandfather and hell with that. We never say that. But when it comes to animals, I am a wildlife biologist by training, and some of you I can see in the organization are. We say that that's fine. As long as the population is fine, don't waste your time on the individual. But we strongly believe against that notion. I think a progressive wildlife conservation, not animal welfare, animal rights, wildlife conservation movement must acknowledge the individual right of the animal within the population, within the ecosystem. And that would be a progressive manner of thinking. Um, and we, we use that basic principle in wildlife rescue. We also recover population of selected threatened species where we think we can make a difference. I'm, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but the point is, we try to go beyond the tiger, elephant, rhino syndrome in India, which actually completely you know, takes up most of our mind space in terms of wild, wildlife. So we do work on the wild buffalo, of which, uh, I think I have a slide, and I'll refer to it then, or, or the Kashmir stag, the hungul, or the whale shark. Things that exist in India are as important in Indian wildlife and ecology and our psyche as India, but we forget about them. And we try to recover them purely in terms of populations now, because these are very, very small numbers of animals or birds. We also do enforcement and law, and those of you who know my earlier history, you would know that I spent a lot of years in this trying to catch crooks who used to smuggle ivory from India. In fact, a year or two of my life I spent undercover in China and Japan uh, in those days when I could run around catching crooks. 
Uh, it was great fun, a lot of adrenaline. Then I realized that I have to do other things in life, you know, to, to, to get the elephant conserved as a whole. Uh, but unless you have a stick in a country of 1.2 billion people, the carrots alone do not work. So we do a lot with actual enforcement agencies, with, with lawyers, but not just what Jaisima talked about in terms of talking to them, but actually I have boys and girls here who actually go out and make those raids, you know, go undercover, break the gangs, get them into court, and then we fight court cases. At any stage, there are about 20 or 27 cases that we fight uh, to bring them to book. Uh, we also do some short, very short aid at critical junctures. If any of you were in the hall, um, what was that, two, I think, just when that started, uh, there was a wonderful story of hornbills and beaks, um, which was really a very, very small intervention that we did by providing fiberglass beaks to tribals. We'd used that for 2,000 years, but we seem to have made a real dent in that society. Sometimes very, very small um, actions work as well. We run campaigns, and again, I'll, I'll come to one or two examples in, in the main body of my talk, so I will not dwell here, but not, not just... Uh, talking uh, to children, but we run very focused, targeted campaigns, and I'll just give you examples. And finally, we work with certain key communities, long term, we're talking 10, 15, 20 years, right, to reduce the dependence on wildlife, on animals, and on the habitats that animals require. Forget the, the time span, I think uh, we tried to make an animation, it didn't work very well, but nevertheless, let me just tell you some things that we consider uh, as, as milestones that we've done over these 15 odd years. It's been a little more than 15 years, 16 years. So we have, specifically for enforcement and training, we have addressed the frontline forest guard, who nobody talks to, people talk to their officers, but I'm talking about people who actually walk the forest. Forest officers never walk the forest, or, or almost never. Um, they go in jeeps. The people who walk the forest are the forest guards, or the watchers, the temporary watchers. And we have uh, trained and equipped more than 12,000 of them in more than 100 protected areas of India over these, over these 15 years or 14 years. Um, and with their help, have actually curbed some wildlife crime in and around those sanctions. We also ensure, although we are not the government of India, we ensure 17,000 uh, forest, frontline forest staff of India so they can go out and protect animals, knowing that their life is also protected. That if something happens to them, and, and unfortunately a lot happens to them, because we pay out between 20 and 30 every year insurances. So things are happening to the people who work to protect animals who we do not sometimes look at. So we, we, we do that as well. Right from uh, day one, we have been working in a, in a policy arena as well. I'll, I'll come to the you know, on-ground uh, projects as well. But in CITES, if we have, we have been de dealing with it using a number of... Um, uh, yes. Uh, a number of uh, uh, interventions, but if there's one thing we've consistently done is to make sure ivory trade does not reopen. I don't know whether some of my Botswanan colleagues who are in, uh, in in the morning session are here, but as, as I said, when I opposed Botswana and South Africa for many many years as government of India, as the advisor of Indian government, uh, when I used to first go to Southern Africa, they used to think I had horns, yeah, because they thought I was I was harming their development. Because I have great friends there, but I still philosophically can never allow ivory trade. I think it's repugnant to society to kill elephants for their teeth. And that's my point of view. And at least we fought very hard as India. And for many, many years, stalled the Southern African uh, uh, ivory trade initiative. Uh, I told you about the, I, I told you, I referred to the Hornbill Beak uh, thing of Nishi tribes. I'm not going to get into it because my colleagues have done it. Or very recently, if you look at the last one, about a year or two ago, we heard that, uh, that uh, Amur falcons migrating from uh, parts of Russia to southern Africa, stopping by in India, were being killed in the hundreds of thousands yeah, by the Nagas. And a number of organizations that are involved in, in making sure that this was stopped. But I remember meeting the chief minister early on, and he told me, he said, Vivek, what can we do? We are Nagas. Everybody tells us that we eat everything. So what do you think about it? So I said, Mr. Chief Minister, there are two, two ways to approach this problem. One is admit that you eat everything and do nothing about it because nothing can be done because you're an Africa. Or second, admit that you're eating everything because you can't get away from reality and they do eat everything. Right? But 
do something. And I said, if you if you even save one bird, people will say, what a man this man is. He's chief minister in Naga and he has saved a bird because he did everything normally. So he laughed. He said, well, that's a refreshing way of looking at it. So what can I do? So we gave them an alternative and at least another three or four groups also worked very hard in that area, including the BNHS and many others, uh, to ensure that over the last couple of migratory seasons, not a single bird was killed there. Of course, India is a wonderful country. So while we achieved a wonderful victory there of millions of hundreds of thousands of birds not being killed, it got started getting killed in the neighboring districts. So now we are now trying to do something in the neighboring districts. But, but what I'm trying to say is some of these long-standing tribal beliefs can also be changed. Or Indian beliefs, you know, we are a 5,000-year-old civilization. That's a great boon. It's also a great curse. Because everything we cannot change, we say 5,000 years we've been doing it. Who's Cindy Milburn to tell us? Change. Right? We use this as a, a, an intrinsic defense mechanism. So, but sometimes we can show that old things can also be changed. Um, I think both Cindy and Arpan referred to the first center we set up. Uh, it's an I4WTA center with the government of Assam. And in 14 years, we have handled close to 4,000 cases and more than 55% we could treat and release back. Making people realize that rescuing animals is not putting it in a zoo. That's saving a life. That's not rescue. Unless it goes back, and is behaviorally and genetically and uh, uh, in a conservation and procreationally contributing back to the ecosystem, I do not call it complete. And I remember telling him, I said, Mr. Abdullah, one dead body doesn't matter. But if 30,000 women are going to be dead now, that, that concerns me. And we got the London School of Economics to do a, a census and we found that they did, wouldn't starve, but 20,000 of them were seriously affected. So when we do try to do good for animals and we seriously affect 20,000 women, more than two-thirds of their income were being affected. In a place like Kashmir, where conflict is already high, then we have a moral responsibility there too. As Cindy said, compassion is not only about compassion to animals, but compassion to all life. And so we started this project. If any of you go outside, if you haven't bought those lovely shawls, buy them. They buy that cooperative of women. I call them a rainbow product, which is not, uh, not rainbow. There are many uh, versions of the rainbow. And this version of the rainbow is that it's animal friendly, it's people friendly, it's it's a peace product, it's woven by hand, there are no chemicals used, it is a cooperative, and therefore all the attributes that you would like to wish for is being marketed by a lovely lady called Rupa Gandhi Chaudhary, sitting second last row, go to her, buy your shop, and save things. Train hit, what, uh, lots of elephants getting hit by trains and getting killed. In one stretch for 10 years, one boy who went with hair and came out without any hair, stopped all elephants getting hit by trains. Just to show you that if you focus on one area, one problem for long enough, you'll find the answer. A number of reasons. Why does the elephant cross the road? You know, why does the chicken cross the road? Why does the elephant cross the track? There's water, there's food dependency, there's garbage being thrown by the train drivers. It's a question of riding in the train driver, uh, in the train engine and telling the drivers what to do and what not to do. It's trying to reduce some speed in some stretches, not to 25 kilometers as some activists say, but, but to much more... Uh, um, uh, levels that are acceptable to human beings and elephants, and we have shown that we can stop uh, uh, elephants being hit by trains. Once again, they're, they're dying in North Bengal, they're dying in Assam, big country. We need more people, more groups. I, I'm, I'm glad to see so many more Indian groups now coming into the scene to take up such areas, just adopt the idea, some of which we have shown, some of which we have shown, and, and try to uh, take it to more areas. Land, as I told you, we have been uh, securing land using many models, including buying it and giving it to the government, including <coughs> working with the community there and protecting it, including letting the government buy it, but uh, 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 us, you know, being the soft hands for the purchase. Tigers, we don't normally do very much, but we did do in one place where everybody said there are no tigers, everything is gone, and we have shown that tigers have come up. It is now about 32 tigers. I remember when we went in 10 years ago, we said there are no tigers on the Indo-Nepal border. So I, what I'm telling you is, you know, there's a famous Indian book called God of Small Things. From wherever you've come from, you must have heard of that. Heard in of conservation that. too, it was a God of Small Things. Not really the God, but the helper, the assistant for small things. If you keep looking at the large things, either small species or small uh, things that nobody's looking after, or places that nobody's looking after. Well, Mickey, nobody was going. So that's why we did uh, increasing the network. I'm, I'm going to skip one or two of these. Uh, a Manas, World Heritage Site, Protected area, tiger reserve, man and biosphere reserve. You ask the United Nations, they've given all the epithets. In the late 80s, it was poached completely out, and there was nothing left. There was almost nothing left there. The physical infrastructure was burnt. The people were all, all um, 
is processed out of that natural area. And we brought back Manas, and I want to emphasize this, not by litigation and legislation and habitat protection alone. We did all of that. Or by training guards or whatever. We did all of that. We gave money to the forest government. None of that is what brought it back. What brought it back was we put back elephants there. We put back rhinos there. We put back bears there. And seeing these individual animal stories, the people came. They celebrated the fact that their Manas was coming back. Their politicians started seeking me out, not the other way around. And I remember that politician saying, you are looking after one Manasas, I've got three, why don't I give you more land? And I said, why not? Yeah? And this man, one political man, made a declaration that tripled the size of the World Heritage Park. He did not do that for ecological concerns, he did it for individual animal celebrations. The fact that his animals are coming back. And that's what goaded him to putting back Manas. And when in UNESCO it was taken out of the Red List, many things in the United Nations go into the Red List. They don't come out. And sitting in Paris uh, at the UNESCO convention, when it came out, I was an advisor to the Indian government, I mean, we had a standing ovation, and I had a number of countries coming up to me saying, how do you get, how do you get sites out of Red List? The United Nations knows only one way. How do things come back up? The buffalo thing, as I, I, as I uh, talked to you about, we have the red jungle fowl, the progenitor of all chicken in the world. We have the wild buffalo of Central India, the progenitor of all buffaloes in the world. And this buffalo, there was one female and seven males. One female. It doesn't take an animal rights or welfare or conservation or any expert to tell you. One female means gone. Right? One also in India means forest. So wild buffalo is also called one bhesa. And I told many politicians that your one bhesa has become one bhesa. It's only one buffalo left. And you need to do something about it. Finally, we took that whole lot into a in the institute itself an enclosure and started very intensive breeding with them. Uh, and finally, we've had one more, after so many years, uh, female, just recently, last month. Otherwise, we had a number of males, at least, that, that uh, population was growing in situ. But we were not having a female. Finally, we had to use genetic uh, techniques to do that. I'm going to leave some of this. Whale shark, I did tell you about those who attended. Uh, and those who attended Andrew McLean's talk would know about our captive elephant care, the fact that, the, the fact that we've beaten, you know, starve our elephants to, to to train our domesticated, our captive elephants, uh, 5,000 of them, can be changed. Uh, Christine is here and Andrew is here and we have shown that. So, uh, friends, I just want to close by saying, 30, nearly 30 years ago, that's what my span of conservation is, I walked into a room in Bombay, in the Bombay Natural Society, and there was an older gentleman who later I knew was uh, the number two of that organization. And he said, young man, you want to do conservation? I said, yes. He said, do you know how to play a game of chess? I didn't understand the connection, right? Uh, I said, yes, sir, I do. He said, do you know how to lose? So, again, a very strange question. So, <laughs> he said, I try not to lose. He said, you know, conservation is a game of chess that you can lose any time in your life. Are you prepared? I had not really thought of it, and I, but I said, yes, sir. He said, okay, it's a game that you may never win in your life. Are you prepared? So I said, possibly, sir. He said, all right, then you sit in front of me, take a seat, and we'll play a game of chess. He said, but once you sit and start that game of chess, you have no business to get up and leave till that game is over. It's been nearly 30 years, friends, I've been playing this game, I've not been able to get up and leave. Uh, the latest in my venture is to get all of you here, with Rod and Kim and Dale and everybody else, uh, to India, and I hope this, uh, this, this game of increasing animal well-being, whether it be through the rights philosophy, the welfare philosophy, or the conservation philosophy, or help people and they'll help animals philosophy, whatever it is, I hope this continues and we continue sharing and learning for the well-being of animals. Thank you very much. I can't stop grinning. It was that thrilling a talk, but questions please.